uh, many of you have heard that one of our long-term members, uh, Cindy Pent, went to be with the Lord yesterday. And uh, we will be uh, making arrangements in the next day or so for, for the funeral services in a week or so. Um, Cindy is uh, one, of the, one of the few people here who has been here longer than we have been, uh, than I have been. And um, he was a great legacy. Uh, not an upfront kind of person, but most of you, if you knew her, have been touched by her and have been prayed for by her. And she has had a ministry of prayer, certainly in my life, that's irreplaceable. And so uh, she's with the Lord. It's great to sing about what we believe. And that gives us a rock, even in times of our sorrow here and now, um, to know that that she's with the Lord, and uh, that's what we have to look forward to ourselves as well. So, yeah, just be uh, in prayer for her family, uh, for Phil and Jesse and Neil and their family and the grandkids, some of whom are here. Uh, Nathan's one of the grandsons, a new member. And so, uh, let's just go to the wor- Lord in prayer. In prayer, Father, thank you that you are faithful, you're eternal. Thank you for sung theology that reminds us of what we have and what we know in you and in because of Jesus, our Savior. We thank you for Cindy, for her legacy of faith, and we pray that you would comfort us and you would uh, help us to be faithful to the testimony she lived of a life devoted to Jesus. Open our hearts now to consider your word and to sharpen us as we pursue Uh, godly standards of influencing uh, our children and uh, kids, young people around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn with me to uh, Proverbs, the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 22, 6, as we continue our series on some of the uh, verses in Scripture that are commonly misrepresented or misconstrued or um, made to say more than they mean. Uh, This is one of them, Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. We'll get to some of the misapplications of that later in my message. But the real topic of this is how can parents and mentors wisely influence children? their children, and if you have a role of uh, influencing other students and children, how can you wisely mentor them? And we'll be talking today a lot about uh, parenting and fathers in particular, but I would think, encourage you to think about how this applies to you and any role you have with mentoring younger people and some of the principles you can draw from this passage. Pray through how it applies to your relationship with your parents, if your kids Uh, with your children, grandchildren, with people you work with, uh, friends, young and old. And my method is going to be to go through this uh, verse and just highlight some contrasts of expectations, maybe make some corrections about some of the things we think about parenting and mentoring. And uh, right up front, we want to admit that parenting isn't easy. We all know that if we've had uh, had kids. Uh, This has been floating, this... uh, Parenting, Welcome to Parent School piece has been floating around for 20, 30 years. I've seen online versions of it. Some of you have seen this. This is a version from Reader's Digest a few years ago. Uh, How to get ready to be a parent. Welcome to Parent School. I'll just read four of the ten exercises. Women, to prepare for maternity, put on a nightgown and stick a bean bag down the front. Leave it there for nine months. After nine months, take out 10% of the beans. Think about that. Men, to prepare for paternity, go to the local drugstore, pour out the contents of your wallet onto the counter, and tell the assistant to help himself. And then go to the, the grocery store and arrange to have uh, your salary directly deposited at the grocery store, main office. Second, to find out how nights will feel, walk around the living room from 5 to 10 p.m. carrying a wet bag wearing, weighing 8 to 10 pounds. At 10 p.m., put the bag down, set the alarm for midnight, and go to bed. Get up at 12 o'clock and walk around the living room with the bag until 1 o'clock. Set the alarm for 3 o'clock. As you can't get back to sleep, get up at 2 o'clock and have something to drink. Go to bed at 2.45 and get up at 3 when the alarm goes off again. Sing songs in the dark until 4 o'clock. 
set the alarm for 5 o'clock, get up, make breakfast, and keep this up for five years, and look happy. <laughs> uh, get ready to go out. Wait outside the bathroom for half an hour. Go out the front door, come in again, go out, come back in, go out again, walk down the front path, walk back up, walk down again, walk very slowly along the road for five minutes, stop to inspect minutely every piece of chewing gum, dirty tissue, and dead insect along the way, retrace your steps, scream that you've had about as much as you can stand until the neighbors come out and stare at you, you are now ready to try taking a small child for a walk. <laughs> the last one I'll share, go to, the, go to the grocery store taking with you the nearest thing you can find to a preschool child. A goat is ideal. If you intend to have more than one child, take more than one goat. Do your week shopping without letting the goats out of sight. Pay for everything the goats eat or destroy. Now you're ready to be a parent. Uh, how can parents and adults wisely influence the children in their lives? Proverbs 22.6 implies that wise parenting is founded on three key understandings uh, about the nature of things. And one of them is the understanding of the nature of discipline or training. Train a child. The parallel concept of this is the word discipline. In Ephesians 6, in the New Testament, it says, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And so a couple of corrections come out of the understanding of training. One is the question of intentionality as opposed to being accidental. Or are you thoughtful or thoughtless in how you train your children? Do you ignore when your kids are recklessly running around damaging property? Do you laugh at your toddler's cute tantrums? Do you negotiate with them when they're smart-mouthing you? Why? Is it because you see children as another form of entertainment? Aren't they cute? They put on a show and we can just laugh at their smart mouth behavior. Do you really think that negotiating with a three or four year old is possible? Are you treating them as if they are equal partners in, in a relationship? Do you, is it because you want them to like you? It's, it's a difference between thoughtful and thoughtless. And sometimes we just react to these things because we haven't thought it through. Do you want them to be your friend, or do you want them to be trained? Because you can't necessarily have both at the same time. Stephen Covey has written a famous book called Seven Habits of Successful People, and one of them is begin with the end in mind, thoughtful and intentional. Uh, train in this verse is the only word that's a command, train a child which means you have a responsibility as adults to be thoughtful and intentional. So think about what does God want for your child in five years? What does he want for him in, in 10 years? What do you think they will be facing or what do you think God wants them to look like when they're 25? Maybe another way to answer this question or be more thoughtful is think about what are the issues, the normal pressures they're going to face? in the next few years? What are the normal temptations they're going to face? What are the normal pressures, uh, decisions they're going to make? And I think sometimes parents act like they're surprised when something comes up and it's just because you, you, you haven't thought further ahead. How is my preschooler going to handle a bully when he's in third grade? And conversely, how, is, how are you going to handle if he's the bully? Because it's probably going to happen. How is my second grader going to resist the temptation to be sexually active in middle school because he or she is going to be tempted? Why are you surprised when it happens? How is your fifth grader going to survive athletic popularity in high school or conversely when, when he or she is a klutz? Because some version of that's going to happen. Why are you surprised? How is your... How is your 10-year-old going to handle it when you tell them at age that they can't go on a date till they're 17 when they're 15? Why are you surprised if you haven't talked about it when they're pre-dating? 
Are you surprised that your elementary age kids' screens are being, uh, brains are being ruined by screens? Are you thinking about this? Train implies thinking, intentionality. Will you be surprised to hear that your middle school daughter will be groomed by social media influencers? Why would you be surprised? Train means we think about what's going to happen. The, uh, the issues are endless, but let me talk about this social media issue. I, and we hear about a lot. Of, this book is by uh, Abigail Schreier, Irreversible Damage, the Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters. I've referenced it before. I, I would refer you to it. Uh, this is a person who has been accused of being a Christian and a right-winger, and she's neither. She said in her book, I don't even know if I know a Christian, but this is crazy, what we're doing. And she writes, and as a part of the solution to the issues, near the end of her book, she gives some takeaways for how to be, to be wise and preventative, uh, thinking ahead. Number one, she says, don't get your kid a smartphone. Now, this, now she wrote this three years ago. It's gotten worse. And she writes, I know parents will balk, parents will groan. Most consider this an unimaginable amputation. How can I separate a teen from her iPhone? But in terms of obviousness, it's not even hard. It practically writes itself. Nearly every novel problem teachers face, the teenagers face, traces itself back to 2007 and the introduction of Steve Jobs' iPhone. I have one in my pocket. In fact, the explosion is, uh, of, in self-harm can, so, can be so precisely pinpointed to the introduction of this one device that researchers have little doubt that this is the cause. If I had told you in 2007 that one device would produce a sudden skyrocketing in self-harm among teens and tweens, you would have likely said, no way is my kid going to have one. And yet here we are, the statistical explosion of bullying, cutting, anorexia, depression, and the rise of sudden transgender identification is owed to the self-harm instruction, manipulation, abuse, and relentless harassment supplied by a single smartphone. Parents uh, train, and uh, mentors train means being thoughtful about what's going on. And she goes on to say, number two, don't relinquish your uh, authority as a parent. And she goes on with th three or four other cases. The third one is, don't support gender ideology in your child's education. This is not a conservative Christian writing this book. We've lost our minds. And, and we have, it, it's because we haven't thought far enough ahead. Train means being intentional. The second correction implied here in terms of thinking about training is, is our focus. Sometimes we think of discipline as all negative, but train in this ver verse is a, is a better term. It's, it's never negative in the Hebrew language, in the, in the Old Testament. It, it means holistic discipline, which does cor uh, conclude correction and rebuke, but it's a loving, and it's a loving parent's obligation to, to rebuke. Proverbs says, 3.12 says, the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. But this means, training means it will be balanced, not just a negative, but balanced, including encouragement, positive reinforcement, the, the outlining of natural and logical consequences. The word train here is a word that is, root meaning has to do with the palate or the roof of your mouth. And so a mother would rub the roof or train a newborn's mouth to prompt a sucking with, with fig juice or, or, or dates to prompt a sucking reaction. So leading them to a proper reaction from birth. A horse trainer would, would have put a rope or a bit in the horse's mouth to, quote, make him experience. Same way to translate train, to give him experience. So it means to start in the right direction. In fact, the NIV has a footnote translation. Instead of uh, translating uh, train, you could translate start a child in the way he should go. It means pointing them in a positive direction. 
third correction implied in this training, not only intentionality and being balanced the po toward the positive, but other, also, also the idea of time. We've already touched on that. We are living in an instant society with instant information, instant food, fast food, and we can't raise children instantly. We need to think long term. In fact, the word child here is not just a word for toddler or infant, but in the Hebrew language it describes a person who is a, a minor all the way until they're mature enough to be married. And then they're an adult. A long term process. It takes time, it takes a commitment of time. In his uh, book, uh, Kevin Lehman wrote a book called Adolescence Isn't Terminal, which I find a comical title for parenting. He uh, tells a couple of stories. He said, it's hard to imagine having anyone a more, uh, having a more fame-filled and wildly successful career than the late great, uh, his name was John. But from his personal remarks, it's clear that John's son, Julian, would have preferred a middle-class father who was at home a bit more. In fact, having a famous father has been somewhat of a burden for Julian. Sometimes when he's eating at a restaurant that has a jukebox and someone recognizing him, people will play a Beatles song to, in Julian's words, see if I'll flinch. Although he appreciates his musical heritage and the genes that his father passed down, because he makes his living as his father did by recording music, he's very clear about the limits of being John's son. The only thing he taught me was how not to be a father. His anger is very evident. He walked out the bloody door, was never round. I admire him on TV. Listen to his words and opinions. But for someone who was praised for peace and love and wasn't able to keep that at home, that's hypocrisy. He goes on to say, let me talk to you ambitious moms and dads out there. You'll never be as famous as John Lennon. Few people will ever reach that level of fame and notoriety, but even if you did, you wouldn't, it wouldn't matter nearly as much to your children as will the fact that you love them, are there for them, and have made yourself a part of their lives. Think long-term, think being present. It goes on to say, every so, every, even so, every, day after day, I come across parents making poor, the poor trade of sacrificing, sacrificing family time on behalf of their jobs. In fact, I know of one junior high mom, this is about 20 years ago, blagged, bragged at her cleverness that she had figured out how to have her friend video uh, her son or daughter at a track meet or swim meet and so she could be there without being there. Well, it's even more possible now. But what your kids want is for you to be there. He was asked, uh, he goes on to say, I was asked to speak to a group of military wives on the topic priority in families and when I was done, the lone man in the room, whom I hadn't seen during my talk, an Air Force colonel, stood up and challenged me in front of the whole room. He said, excuse me, you obviously don't understand the Air Force. When a woman marries an Air Force officer, she understands the Air Force comes first. And he went on a little bit longer, basically justifying why a man would totally ignore his family, put them on the bottom of the list as far as priorities go. I listened patiently until I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, I do, I believe I do understand your Air Force. If you died tonight, your Air Force would have someone in your place by 0800 tomorrow morning. Spontaneously, every woman in the room got up and applauded. The colonel did an about face and left. Everyone is replaceable outside the home. No one is replaceable inside it. Don't sell your soul to the company store. It takes time over the long haul. I'm reminded of Jesus' words in Matthew, 20, in Matthew 6, 26. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? And maybe you could fill in the blank, and forfeits his kids. We're talking about intentional, balanced, lifelong training. Wise parenting understands the nature of training. Second, they understand the nature of people. Train up a child in a way he should. This is dealing with the whole question of why do we even need training. I think a, a fundamental misunderstanding of human nature 
is that people are basically good. This is misunderstanding why we need training, because people aren't basically good. You, you'll hear this on pop talk shows, uh, TV shows, uh, uh, blogs. Uh, if you just love our kids enough, they'll turn out fine, and everybody in the room claps. Well, how do you define love? How do you, how do you define turn out fine? This, again, is like uh, parents who laugh at their smart-mouthed mouth, uh, smart mouth kid because they think he's so, fa he's so funny, so quick. Or they say of adolescents who are, who are drinking or sowing their wild oats, well, boys will be boys. That one of the misunderstandings of this text, I've heard, when your child is in a rebellious fable, don't worry about it, because when he's old, he'll come back. If we think that way, we will miss on, we'll be too passive when they're young, and we will spend the rest of our li their lives reacting and doing damage control because we've misunderstood the nature of people. We could develop a whole theology of uh, human nature and people. We are made in the image of God, Genesis 1. Uh, we have a vacuum and a thirst for God. I think it was Pascal who famously said everybody has a God-shaped vacuum in their heart. But after the fall into sin in Genesis 3, that, that thirst for God has to be cultivated. Romans 3 says there's no one righteous, not even one. And it begins before you're born, at conception. David said in his confessional psalm in Psalm 51, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, even before birth. C.S. Lewis said in The Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe, Everyone is born either a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve. In either way, is not that great. But there's no other option since the fall. Years ago, the Minnesota Crime Commission, I'm not sure they would endorse this today, given the state of sociology in Minnesota, but they, uh, they, uh, they said this, every baby starts life as a little savage. Minnesota Crime Commission report. He is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants, when he wants it, his bottle, his mother's attention, his playmate's toy, his uncle's watch. Deny these, and he seethes with rage and aggressiveness, which would be murderous if he weren't so helpless. This means that all children, not just certain children, are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in the self-centered world of infancy, Given free rein to his impulsive actions, every child would grow up a criminal, a thief, a killer, a rapist. Wise parents, wise mentors understand the nature of people, including ourselves and them, is depraved, including those innocent looking little kids. Then their nature is depraved. It's called theologically the total depravity of man. And so that, as we think about parenting and mentoring, that means we have to be active because it's not just going to happen. And we have to be preventative. We've already touched that. We have to be thinking ahead before what's cute as a toddler turns into rebellion as an adolescence. And then you've not thought far enough ahead. So we need to understand the nature of train. We need to understand the nature of people. Third, we need to understand the nature of our children, your child, or the people that you are investing your lives into. This is where I think we run into some common misunderstandings of not only this proverb, but Proverbs in general. So let me just talk a little bit about the genre of Proverbs. Proverbs are not meant to be understood as universal, absolute truth. Um, now think about, for example, uh, chapter 26, 4 and 5. Answer not a fool, or he'll be wise in his... Uh, I, 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 I got to look it up. Answer a fool, or he'll be wise in his own wise. Answer not a fool, or you'll be like him. Something like that. In other words, those statements cannot both be absolutely true at the same time. What it's saying is that it's really hard to deal with foolish people. And you're going to need discernment in how you interact with it. So it's not an absolute universal truth. The question that Proverbs generally answer is not, what should we do? 
but Proverbs are helping us answer the question, what's happening here? And they are uh, built over uh, times of observation of humans and, oh, this is what happens when these kinds of things go on. And they, Proverbs are, are simply trying to describe the way things are. Train up a child in the way he is old. old when, he, when he is old, he will not depart from him. That's generally the way things are. Fee and Stewart in their, their book about uh, how to read the Bible for all it's worth talk about Proverbs, the genre of Proverbs. And, and another proverb that's often misquoted is Proverbs 16.3 as an absolute promise. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. And so people pray over a business plan and then they're disappointed when it fails. Well, what about Job? His plans didn't succeed, but he, he was not an ungodly man. And oh, by the way, how do you define succeed? So we have to be careful that we don't think of Proverbs as a, a legal guarantee from God. They should be read as a collection because together they give us wisdom about the way things are, and they are meant to be memorable, not necessarily accurate in every theological circumstance. Stuart and Fee go on to say, no proverb is so perfectly worded that it can stand up to the unreasonable demand that it apply in every situation at every time which means it takes wisdom to discern how a proverb, a, a proverb applies in each situation. Uh, Thomas Long, in his book on preaching different literary forms, gives an example of a secular proverb, a, something that is generally true. Haste makes waste. That's generally true. The next time an urgent, fervish demand is encountered, you then have to think through, is this one of the cases where haste makes waste or is this a case where haste means we'll save somebody's life? It's not always true. Sometimes haste is the only option. That's how Proverbs work. In any case, Proverbs 22.6 should not be misread as an absolute promise about raising kids. If you do everything right, they will turn out right because that misses a whole bunch of other dynamics, including the nature of people. But generally, we should understand this as a promise. The second misunderstanding here is, is thinking that if you can just find the right method, then raising kids, teaching kids, mentoring children, is there's one size, and if you do that and you follow it rigorously, it'll always work, which fails to take in the nature of your child, of your individual kids. One of the implications of this uh, train a child in the way is that the way is unique. In fact, the New American Standard translation translates this, train a child in the way, uh, according to his way. So you need to figure out what is the way that works best with each individual that you're working with. So th think about the families you know and how one size does not fit all, uh, Cain and Abel. Biblical families, the twins, uh, Jacob and Esau. We have twins in our family, and they're they're identical physically, but they're all they're very different personalities. Everybody is unique. Everyone has a God-given unique design. Uh, in fact, one of the verses I've used to illustrate this principle over years is Psalm 139, which happens to be Cindy Penn's favorite psalm. It'll probably be uh, the funeral message basis in a couple of weeks but I love this verse and she did too for you created my inmost being you knit me together in my mother's womb I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place when I was woven together in the depths of the earth your eyes saw my unformed body all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now, there's so many nuances of the uniqueness of individuals. The emotional, my inmost being, the physical, my frame, my lifespan, the days ordained for me. From conception in my mother's womb is a reference to when you were in the embryonic stage. God was making you. And it's all from the hands, it talks about being from the hands of a skilled creator. He knit 
We were made fearfully and wonderfully. We were woven. Somebody is putting us together. Somebody was designing us. And wise parents, wise mentors, wise small group leaders understand the unique design of each person you're interacting with. Which means we have to be, as we think about parenting, we need to have perspe per perceptive parenting. We need to perceive the uniqueness of our kids, and we need to understand. Josh McDowell famously said it years ago, rules without relationship lead to rebellion. You have to know your kids. You have to have a relationship, or the rules won't mean anything. And on the other hand, relationship without rules will also lead to rebellion. This means we need to have perceptive and relational parenting that comes from knowing your kids not from just reading a book although that could be good or not some kind of program or not even thinking about well this is the way I was raised and look how good I turned out as if everybody's like you and your family by the way you're not normal I like to say that I'm not normal but we all think we are and we sometimes project that on how we think about influencing kids. In the last couple of years, as my father was uh, in the process and passed away, we were celebrating a, a milestone um, birthday a few years back, and we were sitting around a table, the four of us adult kids, and I was sharing this experience with another man my age, and I, was, and I said to him, and he said back to me, I realized we were raised in the same family, but we, we did not have the same family experience. Completely different experience. Why? Because we're each unique and our parents treat us all exactly the same. They, they didn't intentionally, but it worked well for some and not so well for others. In the same family, because we have to understand the uniqueness of each person. So maybe think through, and sometimes it's kind of fun to do, describe the uniqueness of your child. There maybe are some tools, maybe you can think through some of the personality assessments you've seen at work or from a counselor. Uh, for example, does your child like chaos or order? Are they outgoing or quiet? Does she decide by what she feels or by what she thinks? Is he strong-willed or compliant? Is she careful or risky? Well, just examples, and you think about that, and you know right away you may have only two kids, and they're very different, which means training fits their way. If you have children, God wants you to be wise. If you have influence over children, he wants you to be a wise mentor. How do we do that? Train a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not turn from it. It's founded on intentional, balanced training of each individual child in light of their human nature and unique design. So the big idea is that wise parents, wise mentors understand the discipline, depravity, and design of their kids. And I would encourage you as couples, as families, as leaders, teachers, coaches, think through what are some ways, some tools, some exercises, some conversations we can have that the Lord would use to help us be wiser in how we influence the kids around us. You don't have to be perfect. You can't be perfect. It's not, not an absolute promise. But we do have a responsibility to be intentional, to be balanced, to be understanding the nature of people, including our kids, and understanding how, uh, how unique they each are. Uh, Bob Russell, a uh, pastor, I found his a sermon online, one of my resources. He you told this story in a sermon he preached on this passage. He said, I got a touching letter from a mom in our church who became alarmed about the behavior of her 15-year-old daughter a couple of years ago. She was increasingly rebellious, wore dark clothing, ran with the wrong, wrong crowd. They suspected drugs. Finally, mom discovered a folder in her room, and the folder read, Leave this blankety-blank alone. This is my life. With trembling hands, Mom opened it. She found a series of the most disturbing letters she'd ever seen, and she's not naive. One of the notes had a poem from a boy smeared with blood around the edges, and they discovered that this girl, even though she'd grown up in the church, was involved in witchcraft and the occult. 
Parents were de devastated. They realized their daughter was rebellious beyond their ability to control. So they took drastic action. Within 24 hours, they whisked her away to her aunt. They said, we need to get her out, out of the city for her protection, but also out of the house for the protection of her younger brothers and sisters. The aunt, a dedicated Christian, insisted the girl go through a program called Bondage Breakers. She took her with her to one of her adult Bible studies. She homeschooled her. And one day, she devoted her life to Jesus Christ. She was gone for three months. When she came back, she was a new creature in Christ. Today, she's active in the youth group. She recently gave her testimony. And her mom wrote to her pastor, Bob, encourage people to be obedient to God, even if it's embarrassing, even if it's drastic. We are so grateful that we did. If you, as you move toward a deeper understanding of the nature of training, the nature of humans, and the nature of child, children, you will understand the discipline process and the importance of being intentional, long-term, involved, uniquely understanding your children, the people you influence. And as we do that, God is saying he will honor that. He will work to transform your children through you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wisdom of the Proverbs and for the way you describe the things that, that, that normally can be if we are thoughtful, uh, thinking ahead, understanding the nature of our lives, the nature of how, how people are and operate, the nature of the kids and students, young people that we interact with. I pray that as we seek to be wise, you would bless that and you would you would work in the lives of younger people from very little babies to uh, young adults. And you would help us who have influence in their lives to see the fruit that only you can bring as they listen and hear and see the gospel lived out in their lives. Thank you for this day, for your presence. Thank you for this church family that we can live life together and grow together as followers of Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.